Pulse Oximetry by Dr. Tracy Woolbrink. Hi, my name is Tracy Woolbrink. I'm one of the pediatric intensivists at Children's Hospital Boston. In this video, I'll be talking to you about pulse oximetry. I'll be demonstrating some of the equipment and resources that we have available at Children's Hospital Boston. In this video, I'll talk to you about basic pulse oximetry, some of the indications for using pulse oximetry. I'll show you how to apply a pulse oximeter probe, and we'll talk about some of the pitfalls of pulse oximetry. Mechanism of action. In this segment, I'll be talking to you about how a pulse oximeter works. The pulse oximeter works by emitting infrared and red light and having it pass through a tissue bed, which includes pulsatile blood, the infrared and red light will pass through the tissue bed over to a receiver, which is on the other side of the pulse oximeter. You can see that here. As the red and infrared light passes through the tissue bed, the hemoglobin, which is fully saturated and desaturated, will absorb different spectrum and different amounts of light. So fully saturated hemoglobin will absorb infrared light more readily, and fully desaturated hemoglobin will absorb more red light. And by passing this information about how much light is absorbed, both infrared and red light, the machine will be able to calculate the percentage of fully saturated hemoglobin in the patient's blood. Indications. The indications for using pulse oximetry in the clinical setting vary amongst institutions and may include routine oxygen monitoring for all patients or monitoring only when the provider is concerned that the patient may have a low saturation based on the patient's history, diagnosis, or physical exam findings. Some clinical signs that may make you worried about a patient's oxygen saturation include nasal flaring, chest in drawing or subcostal retractions, suprasternal retractions or tracheal tugging, intercostal retractions, grunting, cyanosis, or inability of your child to feed. In most hospitals, an oxygen saturation cutoff of 90% or less is considered an indication for oxygen therapy. And if you have a patient that has an oxygen saturation of less than 90% on pulse oximetry, your patient should be placed on oxygen. However, this cutoff can vary depending on an institution's oxygen capabilities. That is, in high resource areas, a higher oxygen saturation threshold may be used. For example, here at Boston Children's Hospital, our cutoff for oxygen therapy is usually a saturation of less than 93%. A lower oxygen saturation goal allows low resource settings to be more aggressive about weaning. It should also be noted that determining the best oxygen saturation target while on oxygen therapy is often patient dependent. For example, certain conditions such as cyanotic congenital heart disease may cause healthcare providers to consider withholding oxygen as they have different oxygen saturation goals and oxygen can actually make some of these patients sicker. The frequency of ongoing oxygen saturation monitoring also varies depending on the hospital access to oxygen and the degree of patient illness. In settings with limited oxygen resources, monitoring is often done intermittently, where in settings with ample oxygen resources, monitoring is often done continuously. If you don't have the capabilities for continuous pulse oximetry monitoring, or if it is not appropriate for your patient, you'll want to check the patient's oxygen saturation frequently after initiating oxygen therapy and this will allow you to titrate the oxygen saturations to an appropriate level and then adjust them intermittently throughout the day. Once you have checked a patient's oxygen saturations and they have improved and no longer need oxygen therapy, you should discontinue oxygen therapy at that time. However, you should ensure that you continue to check saturations frequently following discontinuation of oxygen therapy to ensure that the patient is maintaining adequate oxygen saturations. Please note that some studies performed in the U.S. have actually associated continuous pulse oximetry monitoring in acute care with increased length of hospital stay and costs. Application of Pulse Oximeter Probe So there are multiple types of pulse oximeter machines made by many different manufacturers. They're all very similar and you should use whatever you have available in your institution. They have handheld monitors. There are also bench or tabletop monitors like the one you see in this picture. 
You could also use these pulse oximeter probes like we have here to connect to your bedside monitor as you see above. All the monitors will include the basic features which include a area for which you can see your SpO2 or your uh, saturation of oxygen and one area where you can see your beats per minute or your heart rate. They should also usually include an alarm setting for which will denote to the healthcare provider when the oxygen saturations are low. They all also will come with a um, probe connector which allows you to connect the probe to the device and then the probe itself is going to be your interface with the patient. And there are two different main categories of saturation probes, which include the reusable probe. Here's an example of an alligator clip reusable probe, or a disposable type probe meant to be for single use. With the disposable probes, there's often a weight limit that's suggested to be used with these probes. For instance, in this one, you can see that there it's recommended for less than three kilogram infants or greater than 40 kilogram adolescents or adults. On the three kilogram infant, it's recommended to put on the foot or the hand, and on a 40 kilogram adult, it's meant to fit on the finger. That being said, you can often find ways to get these devices to fit um, on patients that are outside of this range. But if you have the capabilities for having different disposable and reusable oxygen probes, you're gonna have the capabilities to um, use these on a larger range of patient ages and weights. When you go to apply your saturation probe to your patient, there are several locations that you will be able to use. In a small infant or child, you can use often the foot, the hand, toes, fingers, or even sometimes earlobes. The one thing that's most important to remember is that you must make sure that the light source and the receiver are opposite of each other, no matter where you place this. So for example, if I'm going to place this on the infant's foot, I want to make sure that the light source here and the receiver here are in direct communication with each other. I can then wrap the elastic around to make sure that it stays on this patient. This probe here, as I showed you before, is a neonatal probe, and so the distance between the light source and the receiver is quite small. Some of the child and infant probes that allow you to place them on the foot will have a wider distance so that you can use them for larger patients. So you can see that I can apply this to the patient's foot, can also apply to the patient's hand in a similar fashion when you apply it here. Again, you want to make sure that the light source and the receiver are opposite of each other. And then you'll be able to get an accurate reading. Alternatively, you could use a reusable. Um, this is a finger uh, reusable probe. It's got a picture of a finger here. And it's meant for you to put your finger inside and allow this to close over the device. These, as long as they're cleaned, can be used on multiple patients. The disposable probes are meant to be used only on one patient, but in certain environments, you may need to reuse them, and as long as you clean them, they can sometimes be reused. It must be said that um, over time, the light source and the receiver may get worn out and may give you not very accurate readings over time. Other considerations for probe use revolve around ways to ensure accurate readings. It is important not to use the probe on the same extremity as the blood pressure cuff, as the pulse oximeter depends on pulsatile flow, which can be impeded by the blood pressure cuff. Secondly, if the probe is used continuously, it should be assessed often for signs of skin irritation below the light. Skin should also be cleaned before probe application to remove any dirt, markers, or other possible causes of probe inaccuracy. Finally, nail polish should be removed from the finger or toenail to which the probe will be applied, as the color can absorb light emitted by the oximeter, 
and interfere with the detection of oxygenated hemoglobin. Pitfalls. So now I'm just going to demonstrate um, some of the pitfalls you might experience um, when using pulse oximetry. I'm gonna place this probe on my finger, placing the receiver on one side and the light source on the other, and wrap the elastic around. And then I'm going to look at our monitor and observe to see a pulsatile waveform, which you now see, along with a saturation of 99% and a heart rate of 84, 85. You can see here that there's a very nice pulsatile tracing, which gives me an indication that this is a good waveform and that my, I should probably trust my output reading. There are certain circumstances when you have a low output reading that you want to reevaluate whether or not your equipment is working properly. And you should also assess clinically what's going on with your patient to determine if the number is accurate. For instance, if, my, if I move my finger around, you see that you lose the normal pulsatile waveform. This can interfere with your signal and can sometimes give a falsely low reading. So if a patient is crying, screaming, kicking, moving around, you may not have an accurate waveform. And then you may not have an accurate pulse oximetry tracing, which will give you a falsely low uh, oxygen saturation level. Additionally, some of the hemoglobinopathies can cause a problem um, in terms of the sensing mechanism and the properties of the pulse oximeter absorbing different wavelengths of light. And finally, and most importantly, the low output state can cause a lot of problems uh, for using pulse oximetry. So patients that are severely dehydrated, patients that are hypovolemic, patients with sepsis, patients in shock for any reason, and patients with low cardiac output can often have a lack of peripheral pulses. And this lack of peripheral pulsatility can lead to erroneous um, readings in your pulse oximeter tracing. Pulse oximetry includes the word pulse, and so you need pulsatile blood flow in order to get appropriate uh, tracings and to get appropriate values. So unless you have a good pulse, you often see a lack of a good pulse tracing and a either absent or erroneously low oxygen saturation level. In these patients, it's important to try to change your probe to a different site to make sure that you're doing everything to resuscitate your patient and promote good oxygen delivery. And these are the patients where you may have to invasively measure what their oxygen levels are, either through an arterial blood gas or other means of um, sampling. Other uses. So in addition to monitoring a patient's oxygen saturation, you can use it non-invasively to look at other indices. For one, you can look at a patient's volume status by looking at the pulse pressure variation. As you see on the monitor, you notice that during inspiration, the notch of the pulse um, waveform is lower than during exhalation. This is often augmented or the difference is often larger in patients that are hypovolemic or in patients that have significant obstructive lung disease like an asthma or COPD, or in patients that are having significant intrathoracic pressure swings because of um, breathing. Additionally, it can be a marker to look at cardiac output. If you have a patient that has a very nice pulse oximetry tracing, and all of a sudden the tracing is gone, you should make sure that you're checking the patient clinically for signs and symptoms of cardiac arrest, and you should make sure that you feel both for a peripheral and central pulse, as this could be one indicator that a patient has just become pulseless. Additionally, as you're doing chest compressions in this patient, you can often see adequacy of chest compressions by taking a look at your pulse waveform. But note that the size of the waveform does not indicate adequacy of chest compressions. You can actually use the waveform as a marker, but always examine the patient and feel for a pulse. So this concludes the video on pulse oximetry. Thank you. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback. What did or didn't you like about this video?
Was the content too simple, just right, or too difficult? Was the length too short, just right, or too long? Any additional comments? You can either click the Start a New Discussion button and type in feedback or send us an email at openpediatrics at childrens.harvard.edu. Note, feedback is not required to complete this activity in the Guided Learning Pathway.